So today, I'm going to thank you everyone for joining. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, and today, I'm going to be talking about how security, development, and testing can work together to stop the same recurring vulnerabilities appearing in the OWASP top 10. So yep, I'm Stefania Chaplin, also known as Dev Step Ops. You can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube. I'm in a couple of places. Um, and yeah, I'm a solutions architect at a company called Secure Code Warrior. But I'm not here to talk about that. So agenda. First, I'm going to talk a little bit, you know, just about me. Who am I? Why, why are you here? Why are you listening to me? Then I'm going to look at OWASP top 10 through the ages because it has changed, but it hasn't changed that much. But we'll come to that in a minute. Then we're talking about the silos. You know, you've got all your different personas. So, you know, who are they? What motivates them? How do we break down the silos? And also, how do we embed security into the software development lifecycle? Finally, I will be doing Q&A on Slack. So you can see the Slack channel at the bottom. It's the topics of interest. So feel free to, you know, ask questions as we go along. I'll be joining the channel at the end to answer any questions. So a little bit about me. I'm going to keep it short, but just for you know your understanding. I used to be a developer, Java, Python, a little bit of C, but I don't really talk about that. Then I moved into DevSecOps, like I really cut my teeth in looking at open source software. It was a company called Sonotype, and that's when I got a real experience of everything DevOps and everything cybersecurity. And I often say about whether it's about security engineers or, or, or champions or, or general people with an uh, a passion in security can often but start to become a paranoia in security. And I'm definitely verging to the point where I'm like, oh my gosh, the world we live in, are we even safe? But anyway, that's a different story. And right now I am at Secure Code Warrior, which is a security training for developers all about starting left rather than shifting left. So, OWASP top 10 through the ages. I haven't gone all the way back because the first OWASP top 10 was actually in 2003. So I'm starting off, you know, with 2007. So we can see we've got some familiar vulnerabilities, you know, injection flaws, cross-site scripting, authentication. Um, so these are, these are vulnerabilities that keep popping up again and again. And you can see as well with the top 10, there's not that much of a change. Um, you can see a couple of things drop, a couple of things added. And similarly, when we then move to 2013 and the you know, most recent official one, 2017, we can see injection flaws is staying pretty much at the top. We've still got authentication, cross-site scripting moving around a bit, but there's a lot of, you know, there's a, a lot of similarity. So we're seeing the same recurring vulnerabilities again and again. So with the latest version, if you haven't seen it, you should check it out. It's very exciting. But we now have at least the draft, you know, ready for peer review for 2021. And there are quite a few changes in this. And it's not just about the topics, which I'll discuss in a minute, but also the methodologies for how the 2021 were calculated. Um, traditionally, we look at CWEs. I say we, OWASP. But traditionally, OWASP will look at CWEs. And what they found is they were kind of focusing on the top 30. Um, with this year's uh, ver uh, version, it looked a lot wider. Um, you know, we looked at like 500,000 applications. Um, instead of looking at for 30 CWEs, we looked at 400. Uh, so a CWE is, um, it's like a type of vulnerability. Um, so for example, um, A10 on 2021, uh, SSRF, that is a CWE. Well, say for example, insecure design, which I'll talk about in a minute, is actually a group of almost 40 CWEs. And each has, it's got an average of, I think it was, I think it said 19.6, we'll call that 20 amongst the different topics. So looking at the actual change, we can see um, injection has been knocked off the top. It's also been merged with cross threat scripting. Uh, we have broken access control. So, you know, all about, you know, permissions, access, you know, when I, I do a lot of training for salespeople and I say my simplification for this is don't make everyone admin, you know, have permissions, um, et cetera. And something that's really interesting with uh, the, the latest version is we're looking at the cause, not the symptoms. So we can see uh, the 2017 sensitive data exposure, uh, that's, um, you know, that's more of a cause, uh, sorry, a symptom. And then now we're going to cryptographic failures because that's the usual reason. 
And the final one that I'm going to talk about, well, a lot, is insecure design, because that is a brand new topic. And the reason I think it's, you know, quite cool is it's talking about design flaws. So as an industry, we're all trying to move left, shift left, start left. We're all, we're all going that direction. And with insecure design, it's going, you know, even further, you know, back. We're thinking about stuff like threat modeling. We're thinking about secure design patterns and principles, reference architectures, because you need to start thinking about, you know, you need to design securely before you start coding, implementing, et cetera. Security cannot be an afterthought because that's kind of how we've got in this whole situation of the same recurring vulnerabilities and why I am speaking to you now about this. So I think of it a little bit like an iceberg because I was top 10. You know, that's why we're here. That's the ones we've got to focus on. But take, for example, you know, I mentioned SSRF as the new number 10. So CSRF was actually in nearly all the other years. So we talk about the OWASP top 10, but what about OWASP 11, OWASP 12, 13? Obviously, we don't rank those, but security is not, you know, the OWASP top 10 is awesome and they are the most, you know, prevalent, but there is a whole iceberg of what we need to look at. Um, others of you may know the SANS top 25. So these are the top, twi top 25 CWEs. And this is the thing, the scope's going bigger. And right now we're talking about application security. Very important. What about, you know, cloud security? We're all migrating at the moment, you know, networking, environments, mobile, IoT. It's not just, um, you, know, you know, design vulnerabilities, SSRF, there's, there's a whole, there's a whole, you know, iceberg out there. And I put this at the bottom, but we, we don't ever like to talk about it. What about human error? Uh, it can be innocent. Um, it can be, you know, tiredness, um, occasionally malicious, but well, that's a different topic. Um, but a lot of, a lot of vulnerabilities are caused by that. And I've even got a stat, I think on the, in a few slides time. Oh no, it's sorry. It's on this slide. So I've got a couple of stats here. I'm not going to read off the slide as such, but maybe if I look at the, the very bottom, uh, the average cost of a data breach is nearly four million. And when we look at that, OK, um, is that um, does that take into account brand? Because um, there is a very famous organization uh, that had a bad version of Struts in about 2017, and they lost one third of their market cap. Like they lost, I think, something like five billion. Uh, it was pre-GDPR; otherwise, they would have been heavily fined. And I'm not going to name and shame, but um, anyone in the open source space probably knows who I'm talking about. And in terms of with Brad, it's been four years later, and people, you know, still know who this company is. So you know, no one wants to be on the front page. And a lot of these um, vulnerabilities um, or, you know, the uh, attack vectors are, are web based. So, you know, coming from, you know, the, the application code. So um, this is something that we do need to focus on as well as the rest of the iceberg. Um, my other stats, OK, slightly old uh, because we've obviously got the 2021 version as of very recently. But um, injection flaws is still in the top 10. It's been number one for like, I don't know, what was it, like maybe 10, 14 years. Um, but this is the thing. It's the same vulnerabilities. Funny story. Our CTO used to be a pen tester and he was aware that the same recurring vulnerabilities kept coming again and again. So he's like, OK, so how do we how do we fix this? OK, who's writing the code? Let's go to the source. Let's um, let's, you know, work on the cause of this. And here we have Secure Code Warrior. But, but anyway, um, and the final one of my stats, 25 percent of all data breaches last year were caused by human error. And that's the thing. We are humans. We can write as many tests and have as many security protocols as, as we possibly can. And that's great. And we should continue doing that. But sometimes people make mistakes. And it's not just insecurity. I think one of there was an article I read um, a few years ago, and it was talking about some of the most costly mistakes ever, but from a finance perspective. And there was it was in Japan. And I think it was meant to be one share was 225,000 yen accidentally got the numbers mixed up. Um, so they put 225,000 shares for one yen. And I think it knocked like, I don't know, I can't remember, it's like five or maybe 11% off the Nikkei for the day. I wouldn't have wanted to be that person if I'm honest. Um, so anyway, this is the thing. It's not just tech, it's not just security. It's, you know, we are human, things happen and we need to try and prevent this. So let's talk about our personas. 
So I put secure, uh, I put testing on the left with a little power button. We've got security in the middle with a little shield. And then I've got my developer in my, in my brackets. And this is the thing, we're all very, very siloed. So my background, I used to be a developer, so it puts me kind of in the right. And now I work in security in the middle. I've done a bit of testing, but anyway, we all have very, very different motivators. Developer, we like our new and shiny. We, we like to do things. We're usually quite creative. I like to think we're quite intelligent. We're into problem solving and we like to focus. And we, we also like our tools. You know, if it's, if it's outside our IDE, it might not get attended to very often, et cetera. Um, and that's the thing, developers are motivated by, you know, features, functions, they've got their deadlines, we've got our sprint cycles, you know, that's, that's our, our, our game. Security, uh, they're trying to find the problem. And the thing about security is, you can find one problem, and you, you kind of done your job, and developers, on the other hand, have to make sure everything's, um, you know, secure. So it's, it's, a, it's definitely an interesting paradigm. Um, and, and they speak different languages. So I talk a lot about username enumeration because I've got some developer friends and I say to them, I'm like, do you know what username enumeration is? And they start talking about, you know, type enum and going down this path. I'm like, okay, okay, I understand why you think that because I'm an ex dev. I'm like, actually, it's when you're logging in and if you, set, if you get your password wrong and, and then it, uh, the application says to you, your password is wrong, then, that's then, you know, hacker knows, oh, I've got the right username. Let's, you know, brute force this. Um, so, you know, when I was talking to my developer friend, he, he, he smiled, he's like, oh yeah, that happened to us. Um, so that's the thing, it's, it's, it's the lexicon, it's the terminology, um, it's the motivators. And then you have testers as well. And testers are kind of, I'm not gonna say like a hybrid, they're obviously motivated by, you know, getting all the tests done. But I've been reading the Unicorn Project recently. And one of my favorite moments is when the main character decides to throw a party for testing. And all of testing are really surprised, like, oh, wow, no, no one's ever thrown us a party um, you know, for testing day. And that's the thing. It's about understanding how to motivate your different personas. So um, example, throw them a party. That's not always practical. I actually had a friend who worked at co-op. Uh, so co-op is a, uh, well, it's a large organization, but he was specifically in the supermarket in the food area doing, doing new research and development for food. So he had a big fridge. So whenever he needed something, say a finance or other department, he'd walk around the head office with like loads of cupcakes. And then he would ask the person, oh yeah, I kind of need that thing. Oh, oh, do you want, do you want a cake? Um, so that isn't always possible, you know, in a virtual world. But it's all about understanding who and what motivates them, because a lot of the time when you get developer and security, it can go um, a bit. Um, it can go either way. And what we're really trying to do is it's almost like the year of the empath, you know, 2021 security's not the bad guy. Neither is testing. Developers just want to do the best thing possible. No one wants to be on the front page. So how do we achieve that? And also, why do we achieve that? So. Part of the reason the old bugs keep performing new tricks. This is an example of SQL injection. Um, you know, SQL injection came out in about 1998. Guess when the fix came out? Also 1998. So we're looking at about 23 years of the same vulnerabilities appearing again and again. And this problem isn't going away because to quote Notorious B.I.G., uh, more vulnerability, oh sorry, more code, more vulnerabilities because we've got, you know, we've got obviously the number of developers is increasing. Uh, we've got, you know, number of languages, number of environments. Now everyone has a mobile team. You know, you've got your cloud team. You know, it's not just looking at, oh yeah, my web-based server anymore. It's you've, you've got, you know, such a massive scope. So head to the source, just like with our new OWASP 21, we want to look at the root cause, not the symptoms. Like, I love testing. Testing is great. You've got SAS, DAST, OWASP has so many amazing tools for that. But you can't test your way to the solution. Testing will help you find it, but it won't, you know, it won't necessarily help you fix it. And this is what we're trying to do. Break the cycle of recurring vulnerabilities. And this is actually, um, this is one of my favorite slides, and I'll tell you why when I get there. But I'll talk you through the flow. So we're going to start in the in the top left where it says bug reappears. I'm going to pretend it's bug appears because we're starting the flow. So bug appears. OK, there's, there's a bug in the system. Then the security will step in. They will test. They find the vulnerabilities for security. It's like, OK, we found a problem. It needs to be fixed. You know, we can't release this. This is a big deal. 
So at which point they will probably put it into a bug tracking system, um, you know, loading the results, at which point security is like, my job is done, I'll, I'll make sure it's fixed, but you know, I, I've done my bit, et cetera. And this is where, this is the bit of the slide that I like, developer finds way to fix the problem. Is it the best way? <laughs> we hope so. Is it the most efficient? Is it the accurate way? Nah. Is it a case where the developers behind budget, behind schedule, tired, might not even understand what the vulnerability is and says, oh yeah, false positive. Oh, oh this doesn't affect us. I'm not using that library. It's fine. Um, and this is the thing. Our developers, do, do they know the best way? You know, it's like I mentioned, the username enumeration. Um, does a developer even know what that means? Does a developer have the bandwidth to go Google it and go read up on OWASP and, and, and understand this? We need to think about, you know, how, how we can, you know, level up everyone, you know, make everyone a security champion in terms of have that basic level. And the same with testing. If we can get even testers, you know, whether it's pen testers, whether it's you know running the testing tools, etc., you know, being able to to understand, you know, have this um, mo like mono culture, mono supportive culture, you know, where where it's no longer a case of pointing the finger. It's like let's fix this together. We're all on the same team. We work for the same company. Let's get it done, etc. So my developer has found a way to fix the problem. But guess what? You know. <laughs> Um, retention is a little hard at the moment with, with development. People move teams, people move orgs, and the knowledge that was obtained disappears into a black hole. And guess what? Then the bug reappears. Let me start this cycle. And working in development, you know, it's bad enough fixing your own problems, like, you know, your own vulnerabilities. But it's even worse when it's someone who left before or has moved team, and then you're trying to understand other people's code. And it's just, it starts to become you know, difficult, monotonous, you know, developers don't really, it's not, it's not our favorite part of job. We like creating, but, you know, I've heard some stats. Well, I've heard some stats about developers spend about 9% of their time writing code. And when I started in development, uh, I was told I'm going to spend 10% of the time writing and 90% debugging. And pretty, I'd say that's pretty accurate. And like I say about the OWASP top 10, there isn't, you know, there's more, it's an iceberg. There's more than 10 vulnerabilities. You know, if you look at NIST, there's over 125. Um, when we look at the top 21, there was four, a total of 400 CWEs. And that can be, like I said, from SSRF, um, CSRF, et cetera, to much broader, like authentication, for example. You've got a lot of different, you know, CWEs associated with that. So how do we embed security? Some people talk about DevSecOps or SecDevOps or Secure DevOps, and they just assume it's like a line in the middle. Like, okay, we've put some SAS scanning, or you know, we've got we've got some testing as part of CI when it goes from Dev to Ops. You know, we're doing security, and it's not quite that easy. So there are a lot of you know the, the best advice I can give is embed security at every step. So part of the reason I'm so excited about uh, the new um, insecure design category is because we're starting to look at the plan stage, you know, threat modeling, um, policies, policies as code is a really growth area. Um, so we need to like, even before, you know, we have, you know, pen to paper, you know, finger to keyboard, we need to start thinking about our architectures, having, you know, this secure by design approach. Then when we're obviously coding, we're going to start doing, you know, some maybe some SAS scanning. We can also do peer review. I like peer reviews. But they're normally about the functionality. Um, are, is the person peer reviewing? Are they a security expert? They probably think they are, but, but are they? Um, and, and that's the thing. A, a lot of the time we're reliant on, um, you know, um, I, I want to say optimism, but it's like, yeah, yeah, no, it's fine. Don't worry about it. it like, you know, let's just, let's just get it through because we all have deadlines. We all have priorities. No one wants to be there at, you know, 7 p.m. on a Friday with a broken build and fixing vulnerabilities. Well, I'm not going to stereotype. I'm sure some people do, but you know what I mean. So all of the things I've been talking about so far, more on the dev stage, you've also got penetration testing as well. But then we have the whole ops stage. And I think that's sometimes overlooked a bit. Like, for example, um, the old A10, I think it's now A9. I am one of those cool people who knows my old top 10. But um, it, it was called insufficient logging and monitoring. Um, and this is like really understated. This is so important because inevitably, touching all the words, 
Um, unfortunately, whether it's on a personal level or on a professional level, we probably are all going to get hacked one day. I actually got my, um, what's it called? You know, the gaming Steam. I got my Steam account hacked just before I went to a conference in Sweden a few years ago. And I was like, oh, wow, it's happened to me. Maybe this is the only time, fingers crossed. Um, but anyway, that's why logging and monitoring is so important because the company that I mentioned, uh, you know, from 2017, it took them three months to notice that they were being hacked. Imagine how much damage you can do in three months. And if I was going to look at the whole of security, obviously everything is important. But for me, one of the most important areas is your incident response team. You know, OK, you've been hacked. How quickly can you notice? How quickly can you kick them out? How quickly can you contain, you know, what's going on? So it's really important to have this at each stage. And, you know, traditionally we think of developers, you know, on the left and up on the right. But it's really about having this understanding of all of these different security checkpoints. Because think about poor security, they're, well, poor security, they have to be aware of all of these stages. And we're just talking about AppSec at the moment. So what about with the cloud? You know, okay, so or, you know, we're using containers. Are we doing container scanning? Where are our containers? Are they in Kubernetes or are they also in you know, the cloud as well? So there's so much. So that's why I really say that it's not about just all the tools. Like you could buy all these tools and are you doing DevSecOps? Well, you're on paper, potentially, but it's much more, it's a culture piece. It's a people piece. It's about, you know, the empathy. It's no longer pointing the finger at the bad guy, etc. So yeah, changing culture is key. And this can be done in multiple ways. You know, bottom up, top down, say middle up and, and down, etc. But having a, you know, we want to get rid of the culture of fear. So even when we look at W. Edward Deeming, who did all the car research, um, you know, um, back in the kind of 60s and 70s, um, even then he said, we can't have a culture of fear because if there is a problem, we need to report it. We need to find out what happened, how it happened, how to make sure it doesn't happen again. And the person reporting or whistleblowing needs to feel safe. Like if that person feels that they're then going to be, you know, fired, um, then, um, you know, they're probably not going to, um, they're probably, they might falsify things. They might sweep things under the carpet. I was reading, I was reading a lot about fear culture recently. Um, and the example they gave was uh, Nokia, because I think we all remember the Nokia mobile phones and the monopoly they had. Um, and actually part of what went wrong, we all think it was to do with the Apple and the iPhone, but actually if you do read up, this is quite interesting. It was as well to do with the culture because there was more of a, the top level management, you know, wanted growth. The middle management were a bit terrified and obviously the bottom level you know, just doing their normal job but because middle management weren't didn't you know there was a fear culture they they were afraid to you know report the truth that starts to become a disconnect and this is the thing that it's the culture this shapes the values and attitudes and it shapes the actions so we talk about you know all of the security tools i talked about before and all your different personas but we just have to remember we are we're all trying to do the right thing security aren't the bad guy you know testing is absolutely fundamentally necessary developers are very busy but you know they've got a lot on their plate that they need to um, you know be able to relate to all personas and i think at the moment everything's virtual and we're all remote as we as we gradually go back to offices we'll, we'll see what happens but that's kind of almost my most fundamental message um, you know, of this. It really is about understanding the people, changing the culture. And you can do that as an individual. You can do it as a senior management. It's really about um, taking a more progressive and empathetic approach. So that you can resolve all the security issues together because, like I said, the same recurring vulnerabilities keep appearing. I think that would be something I'd love to see. I'll probably by now 2025. But if we could just change them, because we're like, guess what? We sold the OWASP top 10. Now we're focusing on 11, 12, 13, you know, up to 20, et cetera. But, you know, we'll see. I'm, I'm always an optimist about this. And this is, this is something that I, I like to think of. I did kind of allude to it earlier, but security champions. We often think of these as developers. I call them either with a passion or paranoia about security. But why do they have to be developers? Can't a tester? be a security champion. Um, what about someone in finance, you know, who's with the CFO being like, uh, yeah, I've been reading about ransomware in the news and I heard about the pipeline in America. I think we should invest more. Let me, let me give you some more discretionary budget, you know? It's about really having this security first approach, no matter who you are. So that as well, you know, security champions doesn't have to be developer. It can be anyone. You can be in security and you can be a security champion. So to summarize, 
Security threats are ever evolving and a developer led approach is needed to detect and eliminate risk. And I think especially with eliminate because we're great at detecting, detecting risk. I'm sure everyone out there in an enterprise org will have multiple, you know, little uh, multiple reports, red risk, orange, CVSS, you know, it's, it's, it's bad, but we really need to focus on eliminating the risk. How do we do that? embedding security at every stage and breaking down the silos. And it's not just between the three personas I've mentioned, you know, between the commercial team as well, between product project managers, etc. And finally, changing culture is key and giving teams the tools to do that really helps. Um, you, a funny story just before I close, there I was a few years ago, you know, taking a train home to my parents, um, just on Instagram stories, I see a friend of a friend, she like works in fashion, she's working at her uncle's startup, like doing like um, social media. She's editing HTML on a Word document and she captioned it like, oh my God, coding's so hard. And I'm like, if you're literally changing tags and colons and everything on Word, of course it is. At which point, you know, I sent her a message, I'm like, babe, have you ever heard of an IDE? But anyway, that's a, it's a bit of a silly example, but give the teams the right tools, change the culture, avoid fear, embed security at every stage, detect and eliminate risk. So thank you so much, everyone, for listening. I hope you have a great rest of day. I know there's some really awesome sessions. Um, if you've got any questions, I'll be in the Q&A. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me on YouTube, Instagram, or under DevStepOps. I've got my email, LinkedIn as well. So yeah, happy to answer any questions. And thank you so much for listening.